Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here on such a beautiful day when I know we're all very tempted to go outside and absorb that sunshine that seems like this will be the last ever sunshine we'll ever experience. I assure you, it will, there will be more tomorrow. You will not regret being here. Um, so I'm Susan Mokris of the CUPS office. CUPS stands for Community University Partnerships and Service Learning. And it's my great pleasure to be co-hosting along with Barry Tinkler of the Department of Education and the School of Education and Social Services a visit from Dr. Nick Cockforth. Um, I'm going to put on my reading glasses to make sure that I correctly introduce Dr. Cockforth's titles and official um, information here on set. Dr. Cockforth is Chair of the Department of Research and Information Science and Professor of Research Methods and Statistics in the Morebridge College of Education at the University of Denver. That's one of his jobs. And then more relevant to the CPAR Community Participatory Action Research Methods that he will be talking about, he is adjunct professor with the Rocky Mountain Prevention Research Center at the Colorado School of Public Health, which is located at the University of Colorado in Denver. He obtained his PhD in Curriculum Instruction and Evaluation from the University of Illinois at Chicago. And Today, Dr. Cutworth will be talking about his current research and partnerships, which involve rural school-based intervention studies related to physical activity and healthy eating among K-12 students in the San Luis Valley and Southeast Colorado. And the San Luis Valley is a rural area in southwestern Colorado, about the size of Connecticut, which Dr. Cutworth will describe. So that's his official information. And now, having had Dr. Cutforth here for almost 24 hours, um, I can say that he appreciates good food, enjoys biking, is an excellent facilitator, and has a curious and eager mind for all folks doing participatory action research. I've been getting to help move him from meeting to meeting and consultation to consultation, and it's been a great delight to see people on our campus light up at the opportunity to hear from someone who pra pra practices participatory action, action research. We have all benefited from the kinds of uh, questions and thoughts and reactions that we've been getting to engage with. So it's with greatest pleasure that I welcome Dr. Cutforth to give us a wrap up. First of all, um, thank you, Susan, for your very kind introduction and thank you for everybody for inviting me to give this lecture today and for taking time out of your busy schedule. Students, I'm so sorry that I have to drag you out of your class today. I'm sure you'd much rather be there. There may be a question for you during the talk today, so stay alert, stay off the phones and try and give me, if not your undivided attentions, a certain amount would be great. But I'm seriously, I'm honored to be with you here today. Um, it's a lot of fun to be in Vermont. Never been here before. Uh, I want to come back. Not just because of the food, but uh, I do want to come back. Um, so I'm very fortunate to be able to work with colleagues at the Rocky Mountain Prevention Research Center at the Colorado School of Public Health. And you see those pictures there? They're my, they're my people. Um, I have been doing work with them in rural Colorado for 10 years now, over 10 years. And we like to think of ourselves as pracademics. Because, do you like that word, pracademics? Um, we like to think of ourselves as pracademics because we balance, try to balance theory and practice um, to address health disparities and promote health equity. We do what is called translational science which is really all about reducing the time it takes to put evidence-based practices in place in schools and communities. What do I mean by evidence-based practices? I mean programs and policies that have been studied extensively and shown to work in a variety of settings. So we've been helping schools implement these evidence-based practices by partnering with teachers and administrators who are committed to improving the health of children in rural schools. And we do most of our work in the San Luis Valley. It's a region, rural region of southern Colorado, roughly the size, as Susan said, of Connecticut. 
It's on the strength of this work that I think I've been invited here to speak about the good things that can happen when academics and community members come together to design and implement programs that increase K-12 kids' opportunities for physical activity and healthy eating. So my talk today, first I'm gonna share my impressions of some of the challenges facing rural communities um, in which my colleagues and I do our work, and I think they apply to many American rural communities. Then I'm gonna describe how two partnerships and have led to programs that have increased opportunities for healthy eating and physical activity in schools. And then I'm going to end with some reflections about the features of these partnerships that have led to the program's success. So community partnerships, they are rooted in the idea that expertise is widely distributed. University researchers like me have some valuable knowledge that could enhance the quality of communities, but if we're going to do research, particularly in rural communities, we'd better do it in partnership with people from those communities who have different sets of expertise and different points of view. But first, let's take a step back. Rural America is not homogeneous, right? And if one is going to engage in rural research, then you've got to accept this notion. It's crucial. Often, rural America evokes idyllic images. Think uh, Little House on the Prairie or the Andy Griffith Show. These are idyllic views, right? One in which trees and fields explode in green and cattle graze beside old barns. Indeed, America is often wrapped up, um, has often wrapped up rural life in a snug cocoon of fantasy. Values such as economic independence, just rewards for hard work, co co community cohesion, strong families, close ties to the land, those things are often mentioned. Last year's election brought new attention to rural America, and this attention is overdue, I think. Rural America has largely been ignored by reporters, by researchers, and policymakers. Much of this attention is useful and important because almost 75% of the United States land area belongs to rural counties. These counties you see them in the blue areas of the map. The green, the yellow, and the orange areas are small, medium, and larger metropolitan areas. Over 45 million people, roughly 15% of the population of the country, live in rural areas. So as I said earlier, America is not homogeneous, and the San Luis Valley the region that I'm going to talk about today includes some of the poorest counties in the United States. The San Luis Valley, as you can see, is a wide plain nestled amidst the high peaks of southern Colorado, about 250 miles southwest of Denver. Actually, the vastness of the land renders the term valley somewhat of a misnomer. At altitudes of above 7,000 feet, the San Luis Valley is technically a high desert, but the surface is underlain by shallow aquifers that in places form lakes, marshlands, and warm springs. The valley's scattered wetlands are home to eagles, eagles waders, and wildfowl, and the valley's residents are following in the footsteps of the Utes, the Apaches and Navajo, Kit Carson, settlers, buffalo soldiers, miners, and railroaders. So the terrain of the valley, and I'll probably refer to it as the valley from here on, is reminiscent of the plains of the green of the green of the grain belt. The rolling plains stretch 80 miles from north to south and 40 miles from east to west. 
These plains give way to separate mountain ranges which provide a geographical border to the valley. Rugged mountains and wild lands, stunning views, cold winters, unrelenting winds, high poverty, and low health outcomes characterize the valley. Scattered throughout this valley are small towns such as Alamosa, which is the home of Adams State University, the only higher education institution in the valley, Creed, Del Norte, and San Luis. Communities that each have a deep sense of place. The region relies on a largely ranching economy, but in recent years, small farms have been swallowed up by larger corporate ones. And with larger farms employing fewer people, the absence of a diverse economy has resulted in high unemployment and more low paying and seasonal jobs. Empty storefronts stare blankly onto many of the town's main streets. Businesses and job growth are sorely needed because as one educator told me, quote, we don't want the Valley's biggest export to be our children and our talent. So the San Luis Valley's beauty belies many social, economic, and health challenges. It looks like a postcard, but many of the 48,000 residents do not live picture postcard lives. The six counties that make up the San Luis Valley are actually among the poorest in the state. In four of these counties, one in three children live in poverty, and in the other two counties, one in four lives below the poverty line. These children and their families face remarkably adverse conditions associated with crushing poverty, including high unemployment, poor housing, high illiteracy rates, and a growing heroin, opioid, and meth problem. As one local historian told me recently, quote, in many respects, the region's natural beauty makes its poverty all the more ironic. Money matters when it comes to health, right? And barriers to care are often felt most strongly by rural residents. Much of the population of the San Luis Valley is in poor health, as you can see from this slide. Childhood obesity rates are almost 50% higher than the state average, and the figures are similar for adults. High poverty rates mean that many families are in a constant state of imbalance and chronic stress because their needs so dramatically outweigh the resources or assets that they have at their disposal. These conditions make people more susceptible to taking drugs. Heroin, opioid, and meth addiction is a growing problem which has led to an increase in crime. So individuals with high care, health care needs, such as chronic diseases or behavioral health issues, are especially at risk. Recently, a Texas A&M School of Public Health report titled Rural Healthy People 2020 concluded that rurality is now one of the nation's 14 biggest health disparities. San Luis Valley residents have limited access to affordable quality health care. There's a shortage of primary care physicians and other health professionals who can help protect and improve physical, social, and mental health. And high poverty rates also mean that lots of children don't always know how or when they'll get their next meal. Low housing standards, high unemployment, and high illiteracy rates are part of the harsh reality of the San Luis Valley. And while the schools are the heart of the community for many of these small towns, they are struggling. So let's turn to education. 
Over half of US schools are rural. Compared to urban students, rural students have higher levels of mortality, suicide, obesity, tobacco, alcohol, and illegal substance use, sexual activity and teen births, and lower rates of school readiness, and proficiency on standardized tests. And as poverty rises, the scope of the educator's job has expanded to one of caretaker. And some of you in here, I know, want to be teachers. This is not meant to put you off. This is just meant to tell you the reality, right? Rural students are coming to school with more trauma that educators must mitigate before they can even begin to teach language arts and math. Kids need loving care, right, to grow normally. And schools in the San Luis Valley have fewer resources, such as nurses, school counselors, and psychologists, to pick up on childhood, childhood mental behavioral developmental problems. One teacher recently told me, some days the most you can do is love them and feed them and make them feel safe and hope you can get a little reading in and a little math in. So the schools in the San Luis Valley serve as safety nets for many students whose parents are traumatized by hopelessness and despair, born out of economic insecurities and poor mental health. Kids have rough starts when their parents are addicted to drugs or who are in and out of jail. Many kids have been taken from their parents' custody and ricochet between schools and foster homes. Drug addiction spans generations and breaks apart families. As one social worker told me recently, meth makes you forget that you ever had children. So consequently, over half of the students in our partner schools in the San Luis Valley don't live with their parents. In several of the most impacted schools, principals, principals tell us that children are often late to school because their parents aren't functioning. These kids are often hungry, and some don't want to go home over the weekend. As one principal told me, if they need clothes, the school gets them. If they need food, they get food. If they need love, they get love. It's not a very positive story so far, is it? Um, it does get better. Um, the plight of the schools, however, in the San Luis Valley is further undermined by perhaps the primary obstacle facing rural education. Namely, the tendency of federal and state government to standardize everything, almost everything, in education. The laughable notion that one size fits all leaves rural schools forced to implement policies that are poorly suited for their communities. All too often, rural educators are expected to swallow federal and state reforms that are often unfunded mandates and don't take into account factors that specifically pertain to rural schools. So what are the, what are the implications of all this for academics who wish to conduct research in rural schools. Well, first, we need to take the time to understand some of these challenges that face rural communities and the children, teachers, and administrators there. We should visit the schools. We should sit down with the people there to hear their reality before, before we develop programs designed to meet those challenges. And we should stick around to make sure that these programs work, not for weeks or months, but for years. By taking the time to listen, researchers show that they value the community's knowledge about and hopes for their children. Only then, through shared understandings, can researchers begin to address the challenges facing rural schools. It means not conducting research on rural communities, but in collaboration with those rural communities. It also means placing the values, the knowledge, and the guidance of the community members at the center of the process. 
Since, not, uh, since 2005, I've been a regular visitor to the San Luis Valley. I, in a typical year, I spend about up to 50 nights and days a year there, usually two or three days at a time. As I mentioned earlier, I don't do this work alone, but I do it with colleagues from the Rocky Mountain Prevention Research Center at the Colorado School of Public Health. Our approach to doing research contrasts strongly with that top-down state and federal mandate scenario that I just told you about that schools are typically faced with having to implement. Rather than telling rural schools what they should do without knowing the realities they face each day, we build trusting relationships and productive partnerships with them. We collaborate with them to find ways to put evidence-based practices into place that have been shown to improve students' opportunities for physical activity and healthy eating. And we believe that schools are really important venues for health and wellness interventions. For too long, health and wellness have been put in a silo separate from education and learning. But education and health affect both individuals and society, so they must work together whenever possible. Schools are perfect settings for this collaboration. Our children spend one-sixth of their time in schools, and two-thirds, they eat two-thirds of their meals there. A quarter of US children attend rural schools. And in rural, school, in rural communities, schools may be the only place where children can develop habits that promote lifelong wellness. In the past five years or so, several health and education experts, including the Centers for Disease Control, the American Society for Curriculum Development, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and others, have stressed the need that kids need to be healthy in order to learn. Schools provide an excellent opportunity to teach children about the long-term benefits of nutrition and activity so that healthy habits persist into adulthood. And changing the school environment helps kids be healthier. And healthier kids are stronger learners. So if we make it easier for students to eat healthier and move more in schools, we can help them achieve academically. So the adverse conditions that I've just described facing many of the students in the San Luis Valley make it even more important to promote their health and wellness. Poor nutrition, excessive calorie consumption, and too little physical activity are associated with the prevalence of high obesity rates in rural areas, together with associated health risks including heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, and certain types of cancer. So the school environment plays a big role in ensuring that kids get enough healthy foods and physical activity. As an aside, I thought I'd show you some pictures of school lunches around the world. It's not directly related to my talk, but it is interesting. If you look at the top two, you've got Finland and Italy, and then you look at the bottom, you've got the USA. Probably the only worst lunch you could find would be one from England, but I couldn't find one uh, from England. But you can see the difference there. Um, students who get the nutrition they need are stronger learners. But many families in the San Luis Valley have limited options when it comes to putting fresh, healthy food on the table. Picking up produce may require a 30-mile drive to the nearest grocery store. And when time and money are limited, healthy food can be a luxury for rural families. Insufficient food and corresponding hunger is associated with poor academic achievement and the likelihood of repeating a grade. Students who eat little or no breakfast are more likely to, likely to make errors in school and report feeling hungry before lunch. Offering a nutritious breakfast at school has been shown to improve attendance, alertness and mood creativity, and the completion of simple academic tasks among undernourished students. Dietary adequacy and variety, specifically fruit, vegetable, and dietary fat intake, have been identified as important to academic performance specifically. Let's turn to physical activity and learning now. 
regular physical activity during childhood is also important for promoting, obviously, lifelong health and well-being and preventing various health conditions. Not only does regular physical activity improve health and fitness among children, but they will also build stronger bones and muscles and reduce the risk of developing those serious health conditions that I mentioned earlier. Can physical activity improve a child's academic performance? Well, when children participate in the recommended amount of physical activity, 60 minutes a day, multiple health benefits arise, as you can see from here. Incorporating exercise and movement through the school day makes children a little bit less jittery, a little bit easier to handle, and more focused on their schoolwork. There is also increasing evidence that physical activity improves cognitive function among children. You can see the difference between the brain sitting and the brain after walking. And after at least 20 minutes of exercise, children test better in spelling, reading, and math. Or shown another way, So this research underlines the need for interventions, right? It, to get kids to move more while they're at school. And teaching them to enjoy exercise now will hopefully mean that healthy habits persist into adulthood. The good news is that researchers know that physical activity and healthy eating boost, boosts kids' brain power and academic skills while providing other physical, mental, and social benefits. And researchers also know that there are several evidence-based practices that increase opportunities for physical activity and healthy eating in schools. For example, if kids have recess before lunch, they tend to eat healthier foods. Or if students have access to equipment and inclusive activities on the playground, guess what? They tend to move more during recess. The bad news is that it can take several years for evidence-based programs and practices to be implemented because schools, particularly those in low-income rural settings, don't have access to the information they need. The research to practice delay presents a pressing need for researchers to develop strategies that speed up the time it takes to put evidence-based practices in place in rural schools. So over 10 years ago, my colleagues and I suggested to San Luis Valley superintendents and principals that they emphasize healthy eating and they squeeze more time for physical activity into the school day. But they were hesitant because they were concerned about reducing instructional time necessary to prepare students for high stakes testing. During one of my early visits to the San Luis Valley, in 2006, a principal told me, what we continue to hear is, no child left behind. I haven't heard, don't leave overweight kids behind. It's about keeping kids academically fit. That's foremost on our minds. Since then, we found that more and more administrators understand the importance of making their schools more supportive of physical activity and healthy eating but they simply don't have the time and the resources to accomplish this goal. My colleagues and I realize that if we want schools to be settings for health promotion, we need to provide them with outside support and leadership. And that's what we've been doing for the past 10 years. Back in 2000, our work was funded by the Centers for Disease Control, but since 2010, the Colorado Health Foundation has funded the HELM project, which stands for Healthy Eaters, Lifelong Movers. Now the question, for, only for the students. What's significant about the logos? Or what's interesting? Let's start with AIM, or the right-hand side. And let's, now let's go to the left-hand side. Anybody got an answer? What's interesting? Okay, do we need to go to the adults in the room? The old, oh, sorry, the older people in the room? 
Oh, we have a question. We have an answer. Yes. It shows, it one, is, is one side shows some of the children eating, well, at least with an apple, right? And the other side shows a ball. Excellent, but not the complete answer. Yes? Speak up. There's movement in each one. We're getting closer. Who's jumping higher? No, which gender is jumping higher? The girl. That's it. That's all it is. I just thought that was interesting. And it, was, it was intentional on our part. Oh, my goodness. That was a lot of work. Um, okay. Helms. <laughs> so Helms stands for Healthy Eaters, Lifelong Movers. And the foundation of this project is university community partnerships. And these programs, which I'll talk about in just a moment, have increased K-12 students' opportunities for physical activity, the ball, and healthy eating, the apple. So there are two programs under the Helm umbrella. One program is called AIM, which stands for Assess, Identify, and Make It Happen. And the other program is the PEA, which is an acronym for the Physical Education Academy. First, let's talk about AIM, which was developed by my colleague, Elaine Belansky. AIM is a planning process which stands for assess, identify, and make it happen. And AIM helps schools get environmental and policy features that support healthy eating and physical activity into place. What, may you ask, do I mean by environmental and policy features? Good question. An environment, an, environment, an environment feature is an evidence-based practice that schools put into place. For example, a healthy eating evidence-based practice is to put fruit and vegetables at the front of the lunch line rather than the back. Because research shows that kids are more likely to eat fruit and vegetables when they're put there. Or classroom teachers are trained to introduce short bursts of physical activity we call them brain boosters, to break up the monotony of seat time. You saw the two brains earlier in that slide. A policy feature, on the other hand, is an expectation that schools put into place. For example, that vending machines are stock, only stock healthy snacks and water, or parents are asked to provide healthy foods for classroom parties. Now, rather than telling schools what to do, AIM elicits their voice and their decision-making power. As researchers, we bring our knowledge of best practices for increasing healthy eating and physical activity in schools. And community members, school people, decide which changes to implement based on their knowledge about what works, about what will be a good fit for their school. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how AIM works. Schools first assemble a task force of five to nine individuals. We insist that the principal is on the task force because we found that getting their buy-in is essential for any school wellness initiative to succeed. Other members of the task force usually include the school counselor or the nurse, if there is one, a secretary, a physical education teacher, food service director, classroom teachers, and parents. The task force is facilitated by a trained AIM facilitator in the top right there, who leads the task force through a planning process. Task force members attend seven planning meetings, lasting roughly two hours once a month. During the first two meetings, members assess their school environment by comparing what they have in place to promote healthy eating and physical activity with a menu of evidence-based practices developed by the Rocky Mountain Prevention Research Center. And in doing this comparison, the task force members are able to see the good things that they're already doing. It's important, start with the positive, but also where they're falling short. In the third meeting, they identify evidence-based environment and policy changes known to increase physical activity and healthy eating. 
And in the remaining four meetings, they make it happen by making informed decisions about which environment and policy changes the school should make, and then make a plan to implement those changes in ways that ensure that these changes stick around. Each task force works on making changes to improve opportunities for healthy eating and physical activity. In regards to healthy eating, task forces have introduced water fountains, choices of fruit and veggies at the front of the lunch line, salad bars, veggie and fruit bars, and guidelines for healthy classroom parties. In regards to physical activity, task forces have advocated for more opportunities for physical activity during the school day, including playground improvements, the principal <laughs> One of the principals built that. <laughs> he had a tractor and concrete and he built it. It was amazing. And uh, playgrounds designed to maximize physical activity. So these are some of the things that they've done. They've also, in one case, reinstituted a swimming program, a playground storage classroom chair, which means that recess equipment is safely stored away and returned after recess. And in Two schools, schools have increased the amount of physical education time because they realized that they weren't giving their students enough. Okay, so let's now turn to the Physical Education Academy. It's the other part of the HELM project. And the Physical Education Academy is an intervention that's incorporated evidence-based practices to improve the quality of physical education in rural schools and it's led to increases in the quality of instruction and the amount of physical activity that kids get in PE class. The origins of the Physical Education Academy go way back to 2006 when my colleague Elaine Balansky and I interviewed up to about 40 K-12 physical education teachers throughout rural Colorado. And we heard a very similar story Physical education teachers were, wore many hats during the school day. Often they hadn't received high quality physical education training. Sometimes they didn't even know about or have the resources to attend physical education conferences or workshops. Their principals were fairly hands off when it came to overseeing the content of their curriculum and the quality of their instruction. Most of them had an annual budget of less than $300, and they tended to feel somewhat isolated, both in their school building and from the broader physical education community. Take a physical education teacher from a small rural town as an example. Originally certified in elementary education, he'd been asked to teach physical education by his principal, 15 years previously, he described the challenges this way. Besides being in a dusty, poorly lit gym for most of the day, I find it hard to come up with activities for a broad range of children each week. A common sentiment expressed by teachers was, we do have a district curriculum, but I couldn't tell you where it is. And a veteran rural physical education teacher who's highly respected in her community said, I've been teaching here for 30 years and we've never had a physical education workshop. So despite the need for quality physical education in these rural schools, our interviews suggested that the curricula was often inadequate or non-existent Physical education classes were held in aging facilities that lacked equipment. Lessons tended to focus on team sports rather than on physical fitness and skill development, which are stronger determinants of healthy exercise habits. All the teachers felt isolated, 
and had not received any physical education professional development. Their wish list consisted of wanting more physical education time with their students, more professional development, enough equipment to provide a quality program, and to feel more connected to other physical education teachers in the region. So given the high poverty and the obesity levels in the San Luis Valley, and the fact that there are few structured and affordable opportunities for children to be physically active outside school, the role of physical education programs in building a generation of lifelong movers is vital. And as someone with a physical education background, you didn't mention this, Susan. That's okay. It's all right. I'm very proud of being a physical, former physical education teacher. Um, but as someone with a former, phys as a former physical education teacher, I felt I could play a role in advocating for quality physical education programs in the San Luis Valley. And I felt comfortable doing this because our experience with AIM that you heard about earlier had shown that schools appreciate it when university researchers facilitate them in a process to plan and implement changes that increase opportunities for physical activity and healthy eating. So drawing on our observational uh, visits and our discussions with educators, Elaine Belansky and I wrote two small grant proposals which described the need to partner with the community to develop an intervention to increase the quality of physical education instruction and the quantity of moderate to vigorous physical activity during physical education classes. Moderate to vigorous physical activity is anything, well, walking and above, so to speak. And we're striving for at least 50% of what we call MVPA, moderate to vigorous physical activity, in physical education classes. Both grants were funded. And Elaine and I formed a collaborative comprising 18 individuals, diverse individuals, representing K-12 education and community health in the San Luis Valley, higher education, and state and national physical education organizations. Now these, indiv these, indiv bless you. these individuals all brought unique strengths to the partnership. Four physical education teachers knew firsthand the facilitators and barriers that influence the quality of physical education programs in the San Luis Valley. The administrators knew the, knew the new Colorado State standards and the feasibility of professional development initiatives in the San Luis Valley. The community health advocates provided a broad view of physical activity initiatives in the community and the cultural issues influencing education in the San Luis Valley. The state and national physical education experts knew about curriculum reform at state and national levels and evidence-based physical education curriculum that had, shown, had been shown to improve students' moderate to vigorous physical activity and the quality of instruction. The two Adam State's groups, these university people, PE professors and PE majors, brought knowledge about school physical education programs throughout the San Luis Valley. And Elaine and I brought knowledge of evidence-based practices in public health, physical education, and teacher education, and how to write large grant proposals. So that's the collaborative. And our goal was to develop a plan to improve the quality of physical education in the San Luis Valley's 14 school districts. We held nine six-hour meetings from March 2009 to January 2010. And in some respects, our approach resembled the AIM process. First, we kind of assessed the current state of physical education in the San Luis Valley and we heard administrators and physical education teachers' views about the barriers to quality physical education. Then we conducted literature searches and held interviews with state and national physical education experts to identify several evidence-based curricula. 
and we determined that one of them, called Spark, would be a good fit for teachers in the San Luis Valley. And we developed a roadmap, way too much for you to see here, but the purpose of this roadmap was to identify the roles and responsibilities of students, physical educators, principals, classroom teachers, superintendents, and school boards to achieve high quality physical education so that students graduate with the knowledge and skills to pursue lifelong physical activity. And that roadmap turned out to be used as a foundation for a much larger grant proposal. And the grant proposal had four components, all of them evidence-based practices. One, it had a curriculum, Spark. Secondly, it had workshops so teachers could learn how to implement Spark in their schools. Thirdly, it had equipment because teachers need equipment to implement Spark with fidelity. And finally, it had what we call site coordinator visits. These are like instructional coaches who mentor the physical education teachers once a month, each person once a month for a day, to help them implement a very, very different approach to physical education, one which involves kids moving more and having fun and much more developmentally appropriate. And we developed a rubric for high quality PE, which basically was the curriculum of these meetings between the master teachers and the physical education teachers. Grant proposal was funded in October 2010, and for the next three years, the San Luis Valley Physical Education Academy served students, well, schools, students, teachers, administrators in the region. Now, none of this would have happened if academics like me had relied on my traditional sources of knowledge, such as peer-reviewed articles, right? And it wouldn't have happened if the community had relied on their own local knowledge. We listened to one another in those meetings, we engaged in critical discussions about problems and issues, and we worked together to arrive at a solution. And throughout the implementation of the Physical Education Academy, we conducted research to determine whether it had improved the quality of physical education instruction and increased the amount of students' moderate to vigorous physical activity in classes. MVPA, from baseline, before the Physical Education Academy began, to follow up two years later, there was a 31% increase in the amount of moderate to vigorous physical activity in physical education classes. And this figure is higher than any other national study. We also found positive changes in the quality of physical education and the quality of instruction in particular. For instance, classroom management trended down, gameplay trended down, which is good. With kids are playing one game with one ball and 30 kids, that wasn't happening as much. Fitness activity generally tended to go up and skill drills went up. And the, all these findings are statistically significant. And frankly, I can't go into details, but those, if you really want to read more, and if you're having trouble sleeping, then there's two journal articles that you might want to consult. So I'm getting to the end of my talk now, and my goal this afternoon has been to share the importance of partnerships with rural communities to address health disparities and promote health equity. And there are several features of the partnerships in AIM and the Physical Education Academy that have led to these program's successes. First, we work on an issue that is of mutual importance to the community and university partners. The planning process that created the Physical Education Academy consisted of people who were all invested in improving the quality of physical education instruction. AIM task force members are school personnel who want to make environment and policy changes that improve their students' opportunities for healthy eating and physical activity. And as researchers, we want to speed up the translation process to get evidence-based practices into schools and study the best ways to do that. 
So everyone's on the same page. Second, our planning processes are always well organized. As a result, everyone fully participates and everyone helps create a unity in purpose that leads to success. We find a common time to meet together. Our agendas are shared ahead of the meetings. We have great food and a lot of fun. And most important from the school's point of view, we use our time efficiently and productively so that momentum is maintained. Three, we build on the strengths and the resources within the community. We take great care in recognizing that our community partners possess a wealth of local, cultural, and historical knowledge and lived experience as school professionals. Their collective wisdom brings important insider information and resources to the table that is unattainable to us as outside researchers. And as a result, trust, communication, and respect characterize our partnerships. Fourth, as researchers, we understand the value of evidence-based practices. And the school partners know all about the unique pressures and opportunities facing their schools. With these, when these complementary sets of knowledge and expertise are brought to the table so that decisions are made together, the process is enjoyable and fulfilling, and most importantly, it leads to important changes in schools. And finally, local programs are sustained and knowledge about what works is shared nationally. As a result of AIM and the Physical Education Academy, the people most affected by issues of child and adolescent health in their rural communities have had, their oppor have had the opportunity to shape the policies and practices in their schools. Our work has continued to attract large-scale funding, and in 2013, we expanded the Helm Project to 29 rural school districts in southeast Colorado. And the work is still going on. We trained two of our most talented San Luis Valley physical education teachers in the SPARC program. We sent them to San Diego for a week to learn how to be workshop leaders. And last Monday, not this Monday, but last Monday, we were all in Lamar, southeast Colorado, and they were teaching physical education teachers in southeast Colorado. And just this Monday, just four days ago, we met with our community advisory board in the San Luis Valley to discuss where to focus our efforts in the next five years. So my goal this afternoon has been to share how university researchers can engage in partnerships to support rural schools' efforts to elevate the importance of physical activity and healthy eating in all facets of the school day. The schools that have partnered with us on AIM and the Physical Education Academy have implemented evidence-based practices that are relevant to their setting and have important health and academic outcomes for educating the whole child. And partnering with, many, with these schools over many years has helped us as researchers understand what works in school-based research. On a personal note, it's tremendously reward rewarding to work with our school partners to help address important health concerns. My colleagues and I, we see our partners learning together to shape their own programs in ways that go well beyond what we could offer as academics by ourselves. Working in partnership with communities may be a bit harder than doing traditional research in getting you tenure, and it certainly doesn't lead to accolades, although I'm here today, so I guess that's kind of an accolade, right? Uh, but our work, most importantly, our work has met community needs as well as the needs of researchers, and that's important. We've published, we have got grants, and yes, we've got tenure. And we will continue to do our work in and with the community. Working in respectful and productive partnership with people who care and who own the purpose behind the work 
is a real sincere human commitment. And I think it also makes for better science. So with that, if you have any discussions, if you'd like to have a discussion or if you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain either. And there's my contact information together with kids from Sierra Grande School. And if you come up to the microphone and speak into it, that makes it more possible for the recording to pick up your question. So please come forward if you have a question. I have two questions, tell me, actually. Tell me who you are first. So I I'm Gail Raven, and I teach at Castleton University, a couple of our south. That's a physical education program. Health, human, movement, and yeah. sport. I know. That's, yeah, it's a good one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. One question is, how have you continued to help the schools fund their healthier foods? Good question. Simple, um, not a simple answer. But one, they've been able to advocate to their school boards for funding. So a good example of that would be the water fountains. Uh, the, the kids and the teachers in this particular school started a campaign uh, which eventually led to a school board presentation. And on the basis of the evidence that they provided about the importance of water during a school day, the school board decided to allocate funds that might have been spent on something else for those particular items. So that's one specific example. We've also we also connect them with grant funding. We, one of the things we commit to is not to write grants for schools, but to help them ass assist with writing grants for schools. Um, and that's how some of those other initiatives have been funded. But a lot of it, some of it is re just reorganized, a reorganization of resources. Yeah. Mm. Number two. My second question is initially when you were talking about the planning process mm -hmm. to improve physical education, how did you convince the physical educators and the administrators mm -hmm. and the classroom teachers, everybody on your mm -hmm. team, that it was going to be worthwhile? for them to put in that much time planning? It wasn't difficult um, because, number one, we had a little bit of seed funding, seed funding, about $20,000 to support that one-year planning process. So we were able to re um, reimburse schools for substitute pay for teachers. Um, school administrators didn't take the money, although we would have offered it to them. The community health advocates, we paid them $100 a day because they were giving up a day. Um, and the physical education majors also received funding, a little bit of money. Um, and the biggest advantage we have in convening people like this, and which may seem a bit daunting to folks who don't know our situation, is we've been working, I've been working down there for 10 years, so I have good relationships with people in the schools. We know principals and superintendents, many of them by, our, by their first names. We drink coffee with them. We may even have a beer with them. I mean, we, 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 I, I read the Valley Courier newspaper every day to understand what's going on. I read it online. Um, we try and make ourselves um, students of the community and people who, who genuinely um, are committed to it. So being, it's, it sounds rather arrogant, but it wasn't difficult. Um, those four physical education teachers we chose happened to be four of the best in the San Luis Valley. They stood out among their peers, uh, but it wasn't difficult. I mean, we, because we were addressing a community-identified need. Yeah, does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you. Hello. Hi. That was very inspiring. Um, I'm Trisha O'Kane. I teach environmental studies here at UVM. Uh, two questions also. I wonder about, um, do you have any data on the health outcomes? That's quite an increase in physical activity and yeah. obesity rates. And also, do you have any data on how it's affected kids with ADHD or other no. behavior? We, we don't. We do have, um, we were able to extrapolate, um, and I'm not the scientist, my co-colleague uh, is. We were able to look at kilocalorie um, output because of the increase in moderate to vigorous physical activity among the kids. But no, we, did not look, we have not looked specifically at that. This is where we need, where everybody needs a multidisciplinary team mm -hmm. in this work. 
Um, and as I mentioned, Elaine and I brought certain uh, skill sets to the project, but we, didn't, we don't have those skill sets. And if we had, we might have looked at the ADHD issue. Anecdotally, and this is only anecdotal, teachers do tell us, and I think they're being honest, they're not just trying to blow smoke up a trouser leg, um, that kids are more, uh, after physical education, kids, kids come back better prepared to work, that there is less uh, classroom misbehavior. But that's just anecdotal mm -hmm. uh, as far as, um, as what we're hearing. But, but no, we, we don't have those data, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. The second question is about the nature of the physical activity. I'm just wondering, uh, Colorado is so beautiful and we hear so much about the hiking and so skiing and all that. Are these kids, is this part of Colorado? Is there, is there access to parks? I mean, does physical education have to be all inside in a gym? What are they doing outside? Good question. Um, the irony of the San Luis Valley is that it is a beautiful area, mm -hmm. and mountains um, are within 30 or 40 miles, but because of the employment, and, uh, of rather the social class status of most of these kids, they don't um, access them as much as probably you and I would. Um, so that's definitely one issue. Uh, parks, um, there are some parks in some of the bigger towns and cities, or towns, I should say. Um, but in, in the smaller rural communities, there's no, in the smaller communities with 50 or 100 people, there's literally nothing. Um, and um, so the levels of physical activity are low. And one of the other problems is that most, in fact, every, every district apart from one, so 13 of the 14 districts are on a four-day week, school week, mm -hmm. because of funding. They've, they're saving money. So we have this problem, and the principals and teachers have talked to us about it, of kids leaving school on a Thursday and coming back to school on a Monday, often being unsupervised because their parents may be at work or unavailable. Um, and they come to school on, Sunday, on Monday hungry, and um, we hear horrendous stories of kids just playing game, you know, computer games and things like that. So there is access to parks. Um, and recre not recreation facilities, though. There's only one boys and girls club in the whole San Luis Valley, and that's in Alamosa. So there's very few opportunities for structured physical activity. One of my hopes, and it's a bit of a pipe dream at the moment, is that we develop a partnership to look at how existing buildings and spaces that aren't being utilized in these towns, and many of them are dilapidated, run-down, vacant buildings, how we could turn some of those buildings into spaces where people could do physical activity. Uh, one of the latest research articles I read showed that Hispanic women in particular are more likely to do physical activity when it's connected to their churches. Um, so there's a whole bunch of literature out there that we can, we can move into and learn from if we, if we wish, and that's one of the things I'd like to do. But no, the school is the, the, for most kids, school is the primary location for physical activity. It's, it's the only space um, because they can't afford or don't have access to structured physical activity. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh. Tell me who you are. Hi, I'm Casey. I'm a freshman here studying education. Great. Congratulations. Um, I'm wondering what is being done in the programs mentioned to accommodate students with special needs or disabilities? Great question. Um, one of the reasons why we chose, why the teachers and the groups chose Spark, the phys you know the physical education we chose, curriculum we chose, was because it was very intentional around including kids with disabilities in regular PE class. That was one of the criteria that we used to select Spark. So we hear really warm, they make me feel happy, uh, stories of physical education teachers incorporating kids in wheelchairs and other disabilities in the PE class, having older kids, helping younger kids. Um, so in general, I think it's a positive scenario. It certainly wasn't happening when the teachers were using whatever they were using, frankly. A lot of those kids would be sitting in the bleachers uh, or in their wheelchairs, and we were able to create a cultural shift around that, mainly because of the physical education curriculum that we chose, which was a very scripted curriculum. Barry Tinkler here would have a, she'd be very disappointed because it's completely teacher-proofed curriculum. But again, this came from the community. The community said, we need something that's very structured. The PE teacher said, we need lesson plans. 
You know, we don't have the skills to do it. And for once, I had to kind of compromise my philosophy with that. Um, but it does, every lesson has some reference to disab disability. So really important. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Are you getting paid to come up and talk? You get an extra pay? I'm not. Are you sure? So I'm Brittany Moore. Moore. Brittany Moore. I'm a freshman from UVM and right. studying education in English. And I was wondering if there were any volunteer opportunities, especially in Colorado, currently. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'd be a great alternative to spring break or winter break or summer program. I'm just going to. Contact information on the on the slide there. Email me. Um, there may be. I mean, I can't promise anything. But if you wanted to come to Colorado for a week and said to me, "Can we come?" Can I come to the San Luis Valley? And I was going there. I might be open to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great question. Yes, Tom. Hi, uh, Tom Wilson, the Cubs office here. Um, wondering, I saw that there were parents on the advisory committee for the uh, AIM mm -hmm. program. Yeah. Um, not, all, not always, I have to say. Can't it, be. It, it, yeah, because some schools put in the uh, So, what, to what extent is it? feasible, desirable to have um, the involvement of parents and the kids themselves in yeah. planning and implementing the various programs? Great question. Parents, really great, if possible. Parents uh, would be wonderful to have on these uh, committees. Um, for obvious reasons. They know, they know the situation that their kids are going through firsthand. Um, and they may, they may, there is some, some opportunities there to help parents perhaps understand some issues around healthy eating and physical activity. We talk, we've told with the, the idea of having children um, on these AIM task forces. And the teachers themselves have told us, because we thought you know, somewhat naively perhaps, that you know, student council kids would be good for this. You know, these are kids that are used to going to meetings and maybe more attuned to leadership. And the teachers told us that they thought that the, it would be, that it would be, the, the content would be just too mundane and a bit too boring for the kids. However, and I, I'm pretty sure that I'm right in saying this, we've done this with elementary and middle schools, AIM elementary and middle schools, um, and I think at the middle school level there have been some students on the task forces. If they're, if they're not on the task force, there's certainly attempts by members on the task force, particularly teachers, to connect with the kids to let them know what's going on. But in general, the teachers have told us that they felt like the kind of conversations and discussions we were having uh, were, were kind of developmentally a little bit more advanced for kids. Um, I think, frankly, we'd have to look at that again. Um, it, the truth is, though, that those two-hour meetings are jam-packed. They're very focused. They have to be. People don't have time to waste. Um, so we do keep things moving. And that may also have been a consideration. Then there may be simple things like meeting after school and that kind of stuff. But we have done other projects, I didn't talk about them, where we have specifically worked with uh, students. We've worked on a project called the Working Together Project, which is a service learning program, which specifically works with middle school kids. And they go through the AIM process, A, assess, I identify, M make it happen. And what they do there is they identify school health issues, issues in their school that are health related in relation to, to themselves as middle school kids. And that, then they do the identify piece. They identify evidence-based practices to address, it may be school bullying, for instance. That's the one that's come up a lot. And then they make it happen by suggesting to their superintendent, their principal, we need to make these changes. So we have done AIM with middle school kids and teachers, um, but very few, and I think if any elementary school task forces had kids, maybe one or two middle schools. But the Working Together project gets directly at student voice. It's, that's all it is, student voice. Yeah. So, good question. Ooh. Have I exhausted you? Oh, oh, that was a, a very physically active, energetic uh, <laughs> move. Welcome. Tell me. I want to get curious before you make a decision. Okay. Um, I'm Marcel Murdoch. I'm here as, at UVM as a freshman for teaching French, eventually, hopefully. Um, I was wondering how the data that you collected and the methods that you learned from doing this, how you can apply them to other subjects outside of physical education, like how can you bring these 
or heighten the achievements of students in other classes besides physical education? Do you want to answer that question first? Do you have any thoughts on how we might do it? I know you're asking me the question, and I'm kind of holding you back. I just wonder whether you have an answer. Yeah, I remember at maybe my elementary schools, every now and then we would have like a dance day or something, or for my uh, middle school teachers, we should have us get up and do some stretches, but that wasn't very often. Mm -hmm. So you're asking, re re reword the question to me one more time so I get it exactly right. Um, how could you bring the benefits or the techniques that you have found work with mm -hmm. this into other subjects mm -hmm. besides physical education? Now you can tell I'm really familiar with the answer. <laughs> um, well, let's just, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my best shot. Um, if you think about the principle of student voice, in this case, the voice of the community, that's what I've been focusing on here, is in order to do, put anything into place that's going to stick in a school community, then the voice of the community has to be in involved, together with the voice of the academic professors, right? We're supposed to know stuff. Um, so I, I guess one could think about principles of getting student voice engaged in, in critiquing some of the everyday kind of um, learning experiences that they have. Um, I th I'm struggling with, to think about how that would, would, that would work. Um, I think that's about the best I can do. I mean, I think that, I guess I'm going to come back to student voice all the time. I think the people who are most affected by an issue should be the ones that have the opportunity to shape it as much as they can. However, um, I think when it's combined with knowledge, uh, other kinds of knowledge, in, this, in our case, academic knowledge, um, in the case of a kid in a classroom, the teacher, I could see the teacher uh, having a conversation with kids about ways of improving their classroom experience. I know that, back to the Working Together project that I mentioned with Tom there, uh, one of the things that kids advocated for, and it doesn't quite get at your, your, your topic, your question, but one of the uh, problems identified was high-risk sexual activity going on in the school. And that led to a very interesting discussion with the kids, and these were, eighth, uh, these were seventh and eighth graders, basically saying to their school administration, we need a more systematic health curriculum. So it wasn't math or language arts, but it was getting closer. It was health. And the interesting thing about that particular school was the community was a rather conservative one and a very religious one. And I'm not certainly criticizing religious communities here, but the school community wasn't prepared to make that change. The kids wanted it but the community, the, what the community wasn't ready for it. The good news is that community now, four or five years later, is more ready for it. But that's not quite getting at your answer, but it is, a, it, is a, it is an example of what can happen when kids look at data in this case, informal data, interview, they talk to each other, stuff like that. Um, and then they were able to advocate for a change. So I could go on, but one more thing I will say is that another example from Working Together Project was the kids advocated for more after-school programs. The kids were, back to the question of lack of structured physical activity, there was nothing to do after school finish. So one of the things that the kids asked for was physical activity programming, and they were able to get, with their superintendent's support, an array of after-school activities. Now, that wouldn't have happened without the Working Together Project. So, yeah, welcome. Good question. We're getting close to the end. Oh, another question. So I will wrap up the official Q&A right now, but remind you that there's a reception up in Waterman um, Manor, which is on the fourth floor of this building. There's a glorious view from the balcony, so you want to slide on up there just to get the chance to see the view, as well as have some food, and Dr. Cutforth will be there. So I will. There's food. Food. Exactly, there's food. Um, so if you have additional questions, don't hesitate to come up and snag people. Thank you so much for coming.